Good afternoon and very, very welcome. My name is Nils Ilos Koch and I'm the president of UFRO, the International Union of Forest Research Organizations. I think you did very clever coming for this session here this afternoon. I believe this is the, or maybe one of the most important sessions of the whole uh, forum here. Uh, if you look at science, which came only two days ago, there was a new instrument with satellite data looking upon the global forest loss and gain in the last 12 years from 2000 to 2012. And it shows that in the tropics, we still lose about more than 2,100 square kilometer per year. So that's really a shocking figure. So we need discussions form like this. How are the governance and legal framework for sustainable landscapes? This discussion for us is organized by UFRO, the Global Network of Forest Science, by ITLO, the International Development Law Organization, and C4, Center for International Forest Research. And we will try to, in this discussion forum, to explore who governs, how do they do it, and with what effects. We are starting with a keynote address by Ben Cashio, who is professor and director, as you can see on the sign here, of Governance, Environment and Markets Initiative at Yale School of Forestry and Environmental Studies. Ben is also director of the Program on Forest Policy and Governance and he's the coordinator of UFRU's Interdisciplinary Task Force on International Forest Governance. And in that uh, function, he has been gathering forest scientists, forest policy scientists from all over the world and he's now going to sum up building a problem-focused architectures for landscape. Let's welcome Ben Cashio. Thank, thanks, Nies. Thank you very much and to all of you uh, for coming. Um, what I wanted to start with is to say I want us all uh, to pretend that we are in a, a large seminar discussion. Okay? So this is going to be raising some ideas for us to ponder versus, versus me saying this is the way it is. Okay? I'm just going to raise some ideas. So don't cite me as being, if the ideas are bad, just ignore the ideas. Okay? But just have this conversation with us so we can en engage in more interactions um, uh, in this next two and a half hours. Um, so um, what I wanted to start with is, uh, and also I wanted to say too that um, I'm going to raise uh, a couple of new ideas, new conceptual ideas in this talk. So I'm really curious about your feedback. Right? Um, and the background is that, as Neil said, for now the last uh, 10 years, I've been trying as a political scientist with colleagues and students to link our knowledge about the policy process and how we explain how policy is made to actually providing practical and strategic advice to stakeholders about how to better achieve policy goals. And so this talk reflects a little bit of that thinking um, as we increasingly look at, with the task force and, and other efforts, this idea of policy learning and how can we learn collectively about addressing problems. Well, that's the context. So I want to start by um, making two observations about where I think there actually is a global consensus that has emerged, uh, more or less, that frames my talk. So the first is on actual problems we all care about. So it's probably safe to say that there now is an overall global consensus, especially since Brundtland, that environmental, social, and economic challenges must all in some way be addressed. So one can't be at the expense of the other necessarily. They must all be addressed. Um, and, but you can, under, underneath that broad abstract category, we've actually identified some pretty clear things we want to achieve. For example, poverty alleviation or improving forest livelihoods. Um, pretty much every organization and country agrees this is a priority. And likewise, what's emerged in the last 20 years is that indigenous and local community rights to resources is also really important. And this is different from 20 years ago. Now, this is emerging as a, a problem we all now accept as, as fundamental. Um, and likewise, land degradation. And even Landscape Day is about the idea that actually we, don't, we want to ameliorate the negative impacts we're having on, on land and how we're degrading land. 
And even on narrower topics like illegal logging, for example, illegal activity in other sectors is now deemed a global challenge worthy of priorities. Um, and likewise, corruption, how to have best practices and weed out um, broader corruption is also really a key. And likewise, of course, for 30, 40 years now, we've all been focused on deforestation, both for its, um, the problem in its own right, but also because of the impacts on climate change. And so these things are all emerging now as, as critical, and while they're, com while they're complex, we can actually assess how we're doing on them. And so, you know, we all see in this kind of map, right, where the red, uh, the red parts of the map show the most challenging aspects of deforestation, and yet this is where, in the tropics, we've spent so much time the last 30 years, and yet we still have these ongoing challenges. Um, and likewise, we have degradation happening, uh, often owing to uh, bad commercial logging practices. Okay, so we have degradation and deforestation. And we even have, um, oh, that's, never mind, that's a, that's a point for later. Okay, so that's the first thing. Problems, consensus on these challenges. The second then is that there's an overall consensus that the policy responses um, must incorporate um, multi-level governance. So we recognize that what happens internationally by itself has almost no effect, that it's through interacting with domestic and local and business activities that we get influence. So how that interaction occurs has become increasingly important for political scientists and also for practitioners. How does vertical integration actually happen. And even or, uh, Orrin Young and Eleanor Ostrom uh, wrote an article about five years ago in Science on polycentric governance, the need to think about multiple layers. So that's a really important question, how it actually works. Um, and likewise though, and why we're here at Landscape Day and not Forest Day, is because we recognize that sectors interact and impact other sectors. So how that happens is really important since a lot of the problems governing forestry are not owing to uh, logging practices, but agricultural practices in other, in other sectors. So this is also a graph that Manga Bay produced, which you know, just illustrates how um, tropical deforestation, the problem in the first consensus, is largely not owing to logging practices, but other, um, other sectors from palm oil to uh, pasture and cattle ranching. Okay, we all know that, and we also know that um, uh, climate change can affect forest operations. So this uh, rather uh, ugly insect, okay, has, has caused, yeah, I mean, five-year-old kids think it's they're not ugly, but I happen to think it's ugly. Um, affect, um, in my home province of British Columbia, Canada, beautiful forests, destroying and devastating the actual forest because climate change has let that insect have a much wider range, because normally the winters kill off the beetle, but climate change doesn't allow that. So these cross-sectoral impacts are having meaning, meaningful, meaningful and often negative influences on not just the ecology, but also on, on um, those who work in the forest as well, okay, in forest-dependent communities. So all these crazy interactions that we have to get a handle on despite its complexity. All right, so. Um, what I want to say, though, is despite these two consensus, these overall consensus approaches on problems uh, and the nature of what has to be done, there is considerable frustration at the pace and scale of change in the last 40 years. And this COP, you know, illustrates again our frustrations we all have with the limited responses despite the ongoing challenges, as, late, as the latest example in the Philippines tells us. And this is just one of many examples we always get and we see it, we're frustrated, and we go come back a year later to, an, to another COP and it's still not a, lot of, not a lot of progress. Okay, uh, so my argument then is that the failure, the failure of um, this frustration, of this um, uh, not getting to solutions that we want to get to, is not owing, is not owing to a lack of attention uh, to goals and problems. We've spent 40 years now, we've got a great set of goals and problems that we know have to get resolved. The sustainable development goals are simply the latest efforts to coalesce what we already have in mind about problems. So that's not where our challenges actually lie. Despite us every meeting reinventing another list with these same challenges. That's not where our challenges actually lie. Instead, 
Um, the failure, I want to argue, and this is my argument, because we're in a seminar, okay, um, is that uh, the failure is owing to a lack of a learning architecture, okay? Lack of a learning architecture. Um, now, what do I mean by that? I mean um, some kind of learning among stakeholders and academics and practitioners and governments and NGOs and companies, okay, that integrates knowledge about the problems right, um, to the pathways for getting us there. So problems on the one hand and pathways on the other hand. And pathways have not been given that much attention, it turns out. Right? Scant attention, a little bit. So I want to argue that to overcome these challenges, there are three steps. Okay? Three steps. It's a three-step self-help talk, okay? So the, uh, the <laughs> which is a collective, collective self-help. So the first one, then, is to distinguish two very different types of learning processes. Okay? So the first learning process is problem-oriented, and that is actually learning about on-the-ground problems, like what is happening with climate change, deforestation, what is de uh, biodiversity loss. And this is often the, the purview of um, um, uh, climate scientists, ecologists, natural scientists, biologists, okay? Um, or as um, a funny side story is that my, um, my son, who when he was five, he's now 19, when he was five, I asked him, I said, Walter, what do you want to be uh, when uh, you grow up? And, and he said, uh, Daddy, I want to be a scientist, um, but not like you. He said, I want to be a real scientist, okay? <laughs> and he meant these, this first step, okay? We need real scientists to give us information about the actual problem, okay? And then we need a different kind of science for the second question, and that's instrument-oriented. How do interventions, inter, uh, policy baskets, multi-level governance, how do they actually work uh, um, to actually in some way achieve and ameliorate these problems? How do you get these pathways to unfold? How do you create sticky institutions that are actually durable? As we all know, the big problem is we create policy instruments from boycott campaigns to international tropical timber agreements, and we all say they're either not effective or they're not sticky, okay, or we lose interest in them. Uh, so how we get sticky, durable institutions is actually the purview, I would argue, of political science, okay? And we need to integrate better political and other social sciences uh, with the first question. Okay. Now, it's the second question that is not being well tended to, I would argue, and that needs more integration. Okay, so that's the first step. And by the way, how much time do I have so I got a reality check? And I have enough time? Okay, okay. I just don't want to go over. Okay, all right, okay. So the second step then uh, is to identify the type of problem we are facing. Okay, the type of problem we are facing. And I want to argue. Uh, that there are actually three kinds of problems. Now, this is important. Eleanor Ostrom, 20 years ago, in her book, Governing the Commons, said that she was going to focus on a unique kind of resource depletion problem, one in which human beings had an economic self-interest in maintaining uh, a resource for the long run, be it forests or fish, but did not because there was a tragedy of the commons owing to no collective institutions. So she did link a certain kind of problem to a certain kind of institution. And she said in her first chapter, but the problem I'm looking at is just one of many. What we've done with Eleanor Ostrom is we've applied her framework to all problems, and that's a mistake. Okay, that's some problems. I want to identify, therefore, three problems that I think can help us uh, relate policy learning to actually making a difference. So type one problems are win-win problems. And this is where um, you can actually find, thinking of Brundtland, um, economic, social, and environmental opportunities with a particular policy instrument. Okay, so economic interests, social interests, and environmental interests all might actually win out by identifying a creative instrument to address the problem. Now these are the best ones, of course, because win-win or win is actually um, a really good thing. You, know, there's, you, have, you have no conflict, okay? So what are, what's an example of a possible win-win? And don't forget, you need learning to figure out if win-win exists or not, okay? So one example I'm gonna just give you briefly is the example of legality verification. 
that's emerged to address the problem of illegal logging, which has been given sustained attention by NGOs, governments, industries, and businesses um, over the last 10 years, really. And now you've got the European Union, the United States, actually passing legislation saying do not import illegally harvested timber, okay? You've got Australia following suit. So you've got incentives on the supply chain that are going through China to Indonesia, Malaysia, Gabon, Brazil, saying, hey, if you want access to our lucrative market, you've got to show compliance that these things are legal. Now, what's neat about this example, this instrument, is that unlike a global forest convention um, and un that failed 20 years ago, and unlike global forest certification systems that imposed global rules on countries, these actually are aimed at reinforcing sovereignty. They're saying, how can we help domestic governments better enforce their own laws? So they actually win. The governments actually win. They're not fighting this, they actually win, because they're actually getting help through capacity building and some incentives to have um, compliance to their laws. Legally harvesting forest companies also win because we know from Economics 101, if you remove supply, price goes up. So every legal, legally harvesting company in the world, both in the North and the South, has the potential to gain if this instrument is actually implemented under a logical pathway because you actually have uh, economic incentives emerging. Okay. And environmental interests also win because you actually weed out some of the worst logging practices in the globe. And you actually help improve and address corruption and so on. Potentially, this is the potential. But to give you an example of why it matters to think carefully about how this would work is because there are strategic implications for making this a win-win opportunity. I'll give you two examples, because I haven't got enough time there's a whole article on this, but here's two examples. So one example is that you want to maintain your win-win coalition, which means that you cannot increase the standards to such a high level that the businesses who you want in your coalition no longer see the cost-benefit calculation. So too high standards means you lose the very companies you want inside your coalition. Because this is weeding out the bottom focus problem. This is not rewarding the top as certification does. So ironically and counterintuitively, environmental groups need to actually advocate modest standards to achieve on the ground impacts, which seems illogical, but we think it's actually probably true in this case, because okay? the problem is actually a narrow one, illegal logging. Um, now, we do theorize on a pathways framework that once you actually entrench the global supply chain with legally verified products, which by the way, is the only mechanism for actually achieving verification. You've got to actually have some kind of legal verification along supply chains. Once you do that, and don't forget, companies now want to do that because as long as the cost of supply chain tracking is less than the benefits of getting, weeding up the, the worst, um, they have a self-interest in actually being part of the supply chain. Once you do that, and you've got global supply chain tracking happening, you could then increase the standards at that point because then the consumer pays, not the firm. And so there's a logic towards a two-phase process. Now, this is a very brief way of saying, discussing and thinking more carefully about the causal logics as to why support actually occurs influences strategic decisions across the coalition that might lead to uptake and creating a win-win-win solution. Okay? Okay. How much time do I have remaining? Seven minutes. So, okay. So now what I want to go, what I want to say then, therefore, win-win might occur, but only if the stakeholders understand the pathway this collective learning about the causal impacts, will it actually have the influence? If there isn't collective learning, and one organization acts in ways not consistent with the pathway, it falls apart. So you must have learning to take place for this to be effective. Okay, now, um, this means that you need both problem-focused learning and instrument learning occurring at the same time for this win-win um, type one solution uh, to occur. Okay, um, the second step though is to say, well, not all problems are win-win. Right? Some problems actually are win-lose. Right? One organization wins, the other loses in some way. And so we can actually, by undertaking an effort on policy learning, not just identify possible win-win solutions, but also distinguish the win-lose cases, which I argue require different kinds of policy learning and approaches. So I 
argue that there are two more types of problems then that are in some way win-lose. The first is type two, a compromise approach. And that's where all interests get something and give up something. And this is often what we do in political science. We see whether groups can compromise to not get everything but feel okay about the process. And this is certainly what multi-stakeholder dispute resolution processes do all over the world. Okay, you compromise. Um, now one example of this that actually has occurred 20, 30 years ago is allocating different uses across landscapes, which in the United States and uh, Canadian and Western contexts is known as land use planning. Okay, we actually allocate proactively different parts of the landscape to biodiversity conservation, commercial extraction, community forestry, mining sector, what have you. And you collaborate and get some kind of um, solution. Um, now, um, the problem is that sometimes this occurs and is occurring right now Accidentally, there's no overall plan. So powerful interests end up winning, um, let's say multinational forest companies, and communities often end up losing because they have very little power. So the trick here is to understand what instruments might exist to actually create the compromise where no one interest is dominated over the other. And we have examples of this in the world. For example, the New Zealand Forest Accord grants some part of New Zealand to forest companies for intensive plantations. But in exchange, land is granted to the Maori for indigenous uses and also for protection. So the agreement is predicated upon the forest companies supporting Maori and protection, and likewise, NGOs and Maori supporting the industry as well. And that creates a broad coalition of support for this compromise. It's also occurred in British Columbia where I'm from, and now even more recently in the boreal forest. Not perfect examples, because sometimes strategy and logics don't always coalesce, but I would argue we find examples of this that we ought to tend to more and more to think about landscapes and the compromises, okay? Now, um, what I want to say, though, and what is really less tended to, because we often put everything here in a compromise, and we think compromise is a good word. But actually, when it comes to climate change, compromise is a very bad word, right? Can you imagine saying, well, yeah, the science, we've learned about the science, and the science is quite clear that we really shouldn't get above two degrees Celsius because we could have major ecological catastrophes and also um, really impinge upon uh, many developing countries. Um, but we had a consensus compromise approach globally, and we decided that six degrees was actually better. Okay? We had this compromise, and industry wanted 10, and the environment wanted 2, and so we compromised and we got 6, right? Hey, that's a wonderful for type 2 problems, right? But it's disastrous for type 3. So these are actually ones where there's a hierarchy of interests, okay? And climate change, I would argue, is one of the examples of that. And this is where some problems are so acute that they are deemed to have priority over other problems when we say that. So compromise there is a bad word, not a good word. Okay? Now, what are these ones? What are these? So I mentioned climate. Um, but I would also argue there are many others. Indigenous rights, for example, many now argue should exist regardless of what Red Plus happens to do. Okay? Red Plus should not impinge upon indigenous rights. And that's a norm now that I would argue is a global norm. So we don't try to compromise away indigenous rights. We try and see, say, how do we actually achieve them? Okay, so why, are this, why is it important that I identify these kinds of examples, um, which all require some kind of learning about problems, but also the instruments? The reason, I would argue, is that um, identification um, of type one, two, and three problems ought to be made proactively. Too often they happen reactively, okay, by accident. And, and um, so, for example, why do we have land grabs? This is the big term now, land grabs, to discuss when companies, often foreign companies, come in and get access to large swaths of uh, land uh, for agriculture, often to, at the expense of communities and more long-term planning. Well, the reason is we didn't actually have a type 2 process in place, right? or a type 3 when it comes to indigenous rights. Didn't have that in place. And so after the fact, we say, oh gosh, or we might have carbon cowboys emerging with red plus. Well, why did that happen? We didn't think about how to stop carbon cowboys because we didn't think about which problem it was, type one, type two, or type three we were addressing. So we can actually better design our instruments by first saying, 
what problem is it that we're actually identifying, one, two, or three? And that will have huge impacts for the instrument design and the pathways we follow. Now, I recognize, um, oh yeah, the other example is two. So we have deforestation in Indonesia owing to palm oil, um, but if we had a type two um, instrument in place, we might have said, you know what? Um, we're going to allow some deforestation in exchange for biodiversity conservation. But right now, we're having political struggles after the fact, not proactively. So we're, we're reacting instead of being proactive. And the challenge is that by not first identifying whether the problem we're looking at is type one, two, or three, we often apply the wrong instrument to the problem. Accidentally, we do this. Right? So um, I would argue that when it comes to, for example, climate change, we're really applying type two problems to type, type, type two instruments to type three problems. So we ought to ask the question, whenever we're thinking about deliberations today or in the future, is this instrument going to allow us to address a type three problem? Ask the question first. And if it's not, if we decide as a society that no, the challenges are just too high, that we're gonna decide that climate change is type two, not type three, then we ought to be honest about that. Okay? Because I think the problem is we're kidding ourselves. We're saying it's win-win when it's not. It's not one, for sure, it's not even two, it's number three. So either we are honest about that and we try and find creative solutions which could exist, but you can't find a creative solution, like a type three creative solution to a type three problem, when you're diagnosing it as type two. It's impossible. Okay? So we're actually not uncovering some really creative ideas that could be uncovered through policy learning because of misdiagnosis of the problems. And therefore it seems to me if we begin with a much more careful protocol, just the way Ostrom did 20 years ago, we might get some stickiness onto actual problem amelioration versus having one more meeting about how we think the, the problems are getting worse. And with that, I'll stop for now. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Ben. You still had one minute left, so but that's, that's fine. That's so, a miracle. That's a miracle, yes. Now we have two respondents, and then we'll open up for some questions back, uh, answering back from Ben, and then we'll open up for the audience. The first respondent is Daniela Kleinschmidt. Daniela is professor at the Swedish University of Agriculture of Science and head of the Forest Policy Unit. She is also coordinator of UFOS Division 9 Forest Policy and Economics, and by that she is really coordinating all in the global network for forest policy. Let's welcome Daniela Kleinschmidt. And Daniela, you'll have about 10 minutes for your respondents to Ben's keynote. Okay, thank you very much. And um, it's an honor to be here today and um, very welcome. Um, responding to Ben is quite challenging. As you have heard, he has lots of ideas and have uh, already some solutions for the problem. So what to say that? So I will concentrate on a specific part of um, Ben's presentation uh, and try to respond to parts of that. Ben highlighted the need for durable institutions and the need for learning capacities and learning architecture, he pointed out. And I would like to concentrate on learning across different sectors. And learning does for me mean learning from, from failures as well as from successes. When it comes to landscapes, we are all aware that they provide essential goods and services and that they entail different ecosystems. And these different ecosystems have different kind of um, natural conditions, but they are all as well covered by different institutional settings. So what governs them is the institutional settings. And so encompassing govern they encompass governance frameworks at multiple levels and as well with multiple actors, so private actors, public actors, and societal actors. These governance frameworks imply benefits as well as drawbacks. And I would like to highlight that these, most of these governance frameworks are coming from a perspective of a specific sector. And this create or might create some problems that might be solved. Ben highlighted this already, that the cross-sectoral dimension in policies is a specific uh, particular problem. Sustainable landscapes provide an overall goal setting or that could set as a bridge for integrated governance framework, and this is what we are talking here about 
about a sort of more integrated. This is why we don't have a forest day and we don't have an agricultural day today, but we try to integrate it in a way. And this is what is to be needed to be done in policies as well. Lots of regulatory and voluntary standards have been already approached with the concept of sustainability ahead. So we have the four standards. Um, ben mentioned some of them. We have the certification system in agriculture. We have them in forestry and everywhere else. So in various sectors, they are approaching already the sustainable approach. We have had a UFRO study on this, on the international forest governance, re re reviewing these settings. And what came out of it is that sustainability is really an encompassing and a really enriching concept that can be used by many. And this is not only true for the forest, which was the forest governance report about, but as well for agriculture and as well for um, resource management and other studies that have found out that sustainability is a concept that is valued. We all know it's already uh, well true for since the 80s, a meta discourse existing. It is global in nature, which makes it so appealing because it can really be served as an integration in this way. And it's integrating in a way as well that it is um, attempting ecological, economic, and as well social perspectives. But there is a risk as well with this sustainability concept. It can end up in an empty box and everybody is throwing in what we have already. So we, we have already forest sustainability in a way, uh, saying that economically, and we just label them different and say, okay, this is sustainability. We throw them all in one box. So this is a bit difficult and that has to be uh, taken into account as well. So far, as I said in the beginning, there is a sectoral, mainly a sectoral focus in these policies on sustainable land use. Yesterday evening, I had the nice opportunity to talk to uh, one person from uh, Nepal, and um, he told me about one example, and I was thought, like, oh, that, that's a good example. He said that, well, you know, um, there was the Forest Act in Nepal in in 1993, and they enabled community forestry and um, with the regards to sustainability, having sustainable forest management, that was the target, and it worked pretty well. So this is a very, this is a success story. So we have success stories at the sectoral level regarding sustainability and sustainable land use management. There is other uh, examples, of course, but these success stories is mainly success for a specific sector. Because with this example, he told me as well about the cave eat of this story. And the cave eat is that the community forestries um, sort of restricted the grazing of the herds in the land of the community forestry, which, well, came with problems for the livelihood about. Because that means that those traditional um, use of land in the higher altitudes and Nepal Himalaya um, region is not possible to do anymore. So it has been restricted, it has been delimited, delimited and it was decreased a lot during that time. So that was the caveat of it. So what we can see is there is lots of sectoral efforts in the direction of sustainability, but when it comes to cross-sectoral ideas, it's sort of um, ends up partly conflicting with trade-offs and with fragmentation. So how do we overcome the sectoral focus and what can this framework um, sort of tie together? So we have these already sort of um, institutions here. A logical solution is coordination and integration as Ben managed, minimizing contradictions. So we want to have a more efficient policy, more integrated, should all work together, less trade-offs, less conflicts, more integration. So. I sort of, why not learning from a policy which is quite well known when it comes to integration and coordination. And when I'm looking at the environmental policy, uh, which is sort of integrated from the beginning on because there is no other reason. So what the idea is, the major of idea of environmental policy is to integrate it into the different sectors, which means like it's given priority to that. And this came about as well with sorts of a problem there has been, it has been identified in the research, there's lots of restriction and reluctancy from the different sectors to integrate these environmental policies. To stop and say that, well, you know, uh, no, this is, not our, this is not our cup of the tea. And I think that's the problem of the story. 
It's not always interest conflicts, that's one part of the story. But the other part of the story is that as an institution thrown on a different sector, which is not, was not involved in the story, it was not involved in, in building these kind of institutions. So it's a lot about the external institutions. So I would like to focus on two lessons to be learned from that. First of all, from the resistance of the actors against the external environmental policies at the one hand, and the progress in developing sector internal sustainability standards as the one, at the other hand. From my pers perspective, um, an integrated sustainable landscape approach demands first coordination and integration process without prioritizing one sector policy over another from the start on. It's not to say that it might develop in the one or the other direction, but not prioritizing one from the start on. And the other one is the inclusiveness of actors at multiple arenas and sectoral experiences which they have gained already about effective policy instruments at the input stage. So what I'm doing is I'm arguing for an ideal policy process, and you can call me naive, it doesn't matter, for an ideal policy process for an integrated governance framework for sustainable landscapes. And, well, the starting point is sort of what has been learned already was in the sectors. There's a lot of knowledge that is existing. And these processes should learn from each other and should allow as well different interests to be explored, to the different perceptions to be explored by each other. And they should enable, and here we are coming back to um, Ben, mutual policy learning on effective instruments. So we should use these experiences, not start with something totally new. Oh, now we are talking about landscapes and we are not talking about forest and agriculture anymore, but trying to use what we have already. What did we learn about the effectiveness of, of instruments? And there is good examples where this learning has taken place already. There is local communities that have already approached total landscapes. For example, I get one, ex one example from Andrew um, um, from the watershed in, uh, for the river basins in Ping River in Thailand, where there have been lots of communities, local communities, dealing with the river basin, including agricultural, forestry, and other sectors in their thinking. And these local communities have as well bind together, they came together to learn from each other and try to building up alliances and federations to extend their organizational and management capacity. So the point here is that important decisions will be made at different times by different groups and in different forums and one cannot expect that these will necessarily be integrated into a single bureaucratic process. So this is more a bottom-up and this is a polycentric and a multi-level <coughs> approach instead. However, I will not uh, let go that these learning activities needs to be supported by institutions. They should provide incentives for communication and um, provide a concept for rationality across different arenas. And it could be a more formal strategic process as well for sustainable landscape governance um, that could second these learning practices. It could be, so to say, the start from the other end. So. Um, my argument here is, I have to turn around the paper for that, that the ideal process is a formal strategy process, and this is the minor part, but now the most important part comes, but which is embedded in much wider and more complex cycle of societal action and learning to which many institutions and processes contribute. So we might have formal processes as these here as well, but they should be embedded in the sort of the live world. And I want to end my speech, I hope I'm in time, with a citation from Dark Hammarskjöld, so I'm coming from Sweden, and he's a Nobel Prize winner in Sweden. And he says, setbacks in trying to realize the ideal do not prove that the ideal is at fault. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniela. Our second respondent is Robert Kilugi, who is lecturer on environmental law at University of Nairobi, Center for Advanced Studies in Environmental Law. Robert is also uh, an advocate of the High Court of Kenya. Let's welcome Robert. 
Um, well, it's dark outside, so I was about to say good morning, but good afternoon to everybody. Um, thank you. Well, I, I take the difficult role of following not just on the main speaker, but also on the first responder, and uh, she invariably has covered some of the areas that I intended to, which allows me to then uh, focus on some of the others more. Well, Ben has uh, spoken uh, on a great... Uh, trajectory with respect to architecture of institutions, and, but primarily two aspects that I'd like to respond to. The first one is that he spoke at length with respect to multi-level governance and also with, this, with the process of learning. And of course, learning is a key part of uh, ensuring success in policy systems. Now, in terms of multi-level governance, my, my view from research experience and just observing how systems work is that the element of functionality is critical in having um, governance institutions work. The architecture becomes incomplete unless you seek functionality. And functionality in the defining sense that laws and institutions are often and brought about for two main reasons. It could be for other reasons, but it could be mainly to respond to a need or to bring a solution to an identified need. So they, they, they normally aim for one or the other. And in that respect, then, it creates challenges when uh, these institutions are operating at different levels and also vertically in terms of various sectors. Now, uh, now the, the level of, in, of, of, of uh, integration with respect to overarching coordination, uh, you know, horizontal integration, is, is usually very critical. And um, I'm particularly reminded of the issue of um, land use planning, now that we are speaking about landscapes. And in, in recent tasks and in recent projects uh, that we've been, research that we've been doing on, uh, on for instance, low carbon investments uh, across three Af countries in Eastern and Southern Africa, one of the key things that comes out is the central place of spatial planning as a tool for coordinating horizontally. And in terms of defining activities, both socioeconomic and environmental, that happen within a geographical space at a very high level, in order then to, to allocate resources and space for others that happen at a lower level. And it has an effect of reducing conflicts, but also defining clearly for people what they do across civil society, across government, across private sector. People know very clearly what happens. And this has been tried with fairly good success, for instance, in environmental management. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, a good number of African countries have what we call framework environmental laws that have put in place a, a very, the framework environmental law itself is a system that is at very high level nationally defining clear obligations, clear roles, what people should actually do. And this has the effect of making it very apparent as to what your job is. It doesn't necessarily remove conflicts, but what it does is lead people in the direction of where do we actually solve these, these conflicts. And in that sense, then, that makes it very functional. Land use planning, and especially through spatial planning, is where significantly um, we are failing. Um, in my country, Kenya, for many years, we've had a system of physical planning that dictated clearly what uh, all other levels of government should do with respect to physical planning, except one factor provide for a national spatial planning process. And so that in itself creates a major deficit in, in respect of how you do this. And what that means, for instance, is that various sectors of the economy that seek to get allocation of space and resources within the geographical space of Kenya, then will have challenges uh, on, how, on how to do this. Tanzania, on the other hand, has a fairly robust national land use planning system. The deficit for that, however, is that it centers the authority and functioning at the high level and doesn't clearly define the, ro the roles 
uh, of coordinating both the high and the lower levels within, within the system. And this is problematic. And this leads me to the second point about uh, multi-level governance, which is the question of mainstreaming of functionality through, um, through vertical integration. You know, defining clearly what the various sectors actually ought and should do. And we're seeing a lot of experimentation with this respect on climate change law where a lot of African countries, for example, have recently introduced systems of government that are multi-layered, either federations or devolved governments. And this is on top of typically plural legal systems that bring together both customary, formalistic, and equally contemporary norms of doing business. And so these, these systems of, uh, of climate change uh, that are coming to place to, to put into place mechanisms for responding to climate change are requiring us to mainstream functionality uh, in the sense of both horizontal and vertical, defining clearly what the national vision of doing this, these responses is, but equally ascertaining the allocation of functions, duties, and resources so that people can actually perform these duties in the course of their ordinary functions. South Africa, for example, has done this very well with its environmental management system, but South African scholars will tell you the failure they have is the lack of a national coordinating institutions. They have done very well in dispersing authority across the system, but are lacking the, the glue that is required to do that. And you find that even uh, players, the, the con if you don't have this functionality clearly defined, the conflict arises not just within government, but it creates a corresponding confusion even with private sector players. Businesses are never clear which, how decisions will be made or how decisions will be aligned. And that can even have the effect of slowing down investments in clear things. And have in mind, for instance, the current debates going on with respect to climate finance. If you don't have a very clear form of the incentives or the funding mechanisms or even the tracking accountability mechanisms with respect to climate finance, what it does is to create an innate fear with people that deficits in the rule of law will affect how you actually do business. And what that does in, instead is then make people look the other way and find other, other options of doing things, which is suboptimal. Because then you have a multi-layered chain where instead of dealing with the government of Kenya, I'll end up dealing with an NGO here, an NGO there, an NGO there. And eventually, while that helps in many ways, if you're looking for an optimal outcome, that is undermined. Now, to, to, have, to have some of these things rounded up, I go back to the question of learning. And I think that learning in policy and institution making and also lawmaking is important because it will help us edge out the question of incoherence both in coherence in terms of laws, in coherence in terms of institutions, and in terms of policies. And one of the things that comes into mind are two types of incoherence. The internal kind, where you have institutions, for example, across sectors that just don't communicate to each other. And, um, and in this sense, for example, um, uh, let's, let's look at a law on livestock management, or a policy on livestock management. And what that does is you have an internal legislation or a policy on livestock that encourages farmers in arid areas to, to invest in livestock on the promise that there is a market. But on the other hand, you've got a law on trade that might want to impose certain conditions of trade. But so long as this is not linked up clearly with the institutions that deal with livestock, the effect of it is creating suboptimal outputs that farmers will not just be able to produce to get a market. And this has happened in Eastern Africa where Rift Valley fever resulted in barriers to trade being imposed by a traditional market from the Middle East such that the, the, the failure to control Rift Valley fever meant that you could not export livestock to Saudi Arabia and other Middle Eastern countries. And the effect of that is that you have farmers then left in a sense of helplessness. And if you apply game theory considerations to that, it just means that the next cycle of investments, they're going to look for something else, which is, and they would have done this quite optimally. And, and this also links to the external incoherences in terms of the, the considerations at the international forum versus the internal, and failing to link up these. And we, we're beginning to see these with respect to the red plus debate 
um, are going on, the, the negotiations going on and the adaptation or the modifications required with respect to national laws. And if we fail to bring into place these internal modifications or if countries are unable to articulate their national positions clearly during international negotiations, then it means the outcome could be such that if you take it back home, you cannot have it modified. And look at the example of the US and the Kyoto Protocol. They negotiated the Kyoto Protocol but could, it get, could, could not get the Senate to approve it. And this, this, this set of incoherences require us to enhance a system of learning. We, we need to have uh, some sort of systemic feedback, feedback loop where we, to echo Daniela, where you sort of have an all-round learning system across so that we learn from mistakes that, that we have and sort of try to figure that out. But most importantly is that it becomes clear that we need to establish a certain minimum baseline threshold of participation by various players, whether it is citizens, whether it's business and industry, whether it's civil society, whether it's just across the public sectors themselves. But this minimum threshold of participation is important. Now, I call it a threshold, is that this participation must have an effect on the final outcome. It is not just merely being decorative and saying that uh, we've held five workshops consulting with people, but it's not clear exactly what the outcome of these uh, consultations is. Now, in order for us to fulfill this threshold, we then have to invest in people. And, and in terms of people, I speak broadly again with respect to stakeholders, whether it's individuals, local communities, um, industry and so on and so forth. And we have to, to invest in people because we need to do this as a way of entrenching the concept of subsidiarity as a means to entrench functionality of institutions. Subsidiarity then con co completes this cycle that you begin at the lowest level, you build the cycle, and you come back at the lowest level. And already you see this in budget mechanisms within certain countries where you see that, for example, stakeholder public consultations for budget making procedures are required within the executive arm of government and are repeated again within the legislative arm of government. And you see that these, this has a way of checking and balancing and making sure that if there was a sector that was left out, it is very likely going to find a voice within the, the legislature. And this sort of brings, brings them back to subsidiarity. So for instance, as part of constitutional obligation in Kenya, parliament is obligated to do a sort of cy cyclic system of of consultations for the budget system, going back to people and doing the same thing over that the executive should have done. Many would argue that this is repetitive, but I'd always say this, the members of parliament are elected by people and they have fairly different considerations when dealing with citizens than bu uh, civil service bureaucrats. And so it helps in many ways that when you have both of them do, then you find that in terms of bringing knowledge, bringing information, and just making apparent to people that this matters um, has, has an influence. And my last point on this was uh, just uh, over the last year, I uh, was doing some research for our National Assembly. And when we were just trying to track whether what people say with respect to climate change budgetary requirements actually matters. And it made a tremendous difference to talk to people. And they could show you the final budget policy statement and say, we made this point during a town hall meeting, and it, the funding is actually reflected in the budget. What that actually means is that you, you have begun the process of entrenching subsidiarity, even it's in, in its narrowest sense, uh, in a sense. And so, so in order to have this architecture complete, it looks as if we, we my, my, my key points would be that we need to focus on building this functionality. And, and by so, and building this functionality will not be complete unless we cycle around with the system of learning. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Robert Kipugi. Now we give Ben Cashaw a little time to respond to respondents, and then we'll open up for questions and answers. Ben? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to just highlight a couple of themes 
uh, that emerged from these two uh, respondents, and thank you very much. I'm still pondering a lot, so some initial ideas are, um, so one theme was this idea that bottom-up seems to be in some way superior to top-down. Um, subsidiarity is an example of that norm. And Daniela pointed out, too, that oftentimes we have too much top-down approaches. Um, and so I'm going to address that point first. And I'm going to raise some questions about that. And what I'm wondering is whether the new architecture that is needed um, doesn't necessarily require a top-down approach because you're not going to have one locus of power. But you are going to need an orchestra in some way, an ar our conductor of the orchestra. So you're on the same page. And it may be that our metaphors for top-down and bottom-up no longer work. And I want to give three examples as to why that might be the case. Let's first turn to the Forest Stewardship Council, which was created after uh, the failure of the Global Forest Convention, where environmental groups, social allies, and businesses decided to adopt high standard forest management practices and certify companies for compliance with those standards if a third party audited for compliance. Um, now, what the FSC did was it said, okay, we're going to have these principles and criteria, okay? Um, they're going to cover things that have to be addressed, like biodiversity, conservation, ecosystem management, indigenous rights, labor conditions, uh, and so on. Um, but they said, but the standards, the specific rules, will be developed uh, through stakeholder processes at the national or subnational level. So they gave it the actual teeth and meaning. Okay? Now, is that top down or bottom up? I can't actually tell you. They actually, in many ways, empowered local communities when their governments were captured by business interests. So they were empowering local participation with a global process. I cannot tell you which one that fits, but I can tell you that it had a good model to it that I think actually addressed the themes you two were talking about, but some criticized as being too top down, right? and infringing upon national sovereignty, but actually fostering indigenous communities, right? Okay. So is, are, we, are, the, are the terms um, working for us? Another example is um, uh, then going to the point that Robert made that in, um, in um, Kenya, that there was a robust national uh, planning system, um, but it meant that the, um, the role of local peoples was less well entrenched and kind of um, taking a back, back seat, whereas in South Africa, it was the opposite. You actually had a lot of community efforts, but not enough national coordination. And I'm wondering too, th these are obviously real challenges, if there aren't solutions that might think of creative hybrid approaches. So for example, where can, where can we turn to? One is in British Columbia. Uh, 20 years ago, yeah, 20 years ago, wow, um, where the government said, we want to foster the international norms that Brundtland identified in her report that the world ought to protect for biodiversity conservation 12% of the land base. So the domestic government had these norms diffused, so the pathway was norms, it went to a domestic government who said, we're going to actually meet our international obligations. There actually were no international obligations, but the government used that norm to say we have to meet them. Okay? So this is a top-down government saying this to the communities and industries, you must do this. And the industries were like, no, it's going to cost us money, they're under long-term forest licenses, we're not going to do it. And the government said, okay, here's the plan. You have to protect 12% of the land base, but we are going to create local resource committees made up of indigenous communities, um, municipalities, the forest sector, the mining sector, the hunting sector, and they said, you guys decide where that 12% is going to go. And, and NGOs, by the way, the whole, the whole gamut. You decide where they're going to go. You draw the lines. Oh, and by the way, if you don't draw them and agree, we'll do it for you. Okay? What happened? In every process where this was brought into place, they got agreement. And these are sticky institutions. They were all scared of the government's possible approach. And 20 years later, these are durable institutions. Top down, bottom up, I have no idea. Okay? But it actually worked. Right? So I think we should get out of our old metaphors and think about our creative solutions. Okay? So the problem is, if you just go local, you just do Eleanor Ostrom, the problem is you have this broader challenge where some problems don't get addressed. Maybe timber gets addressed, but not biodiversity conservation and so on. We do need national or international orchestras. Now, orchestras don't have to be, you know, you know, dirigees. They simply have to coordinate in some way that's logical. 
And the illegal logging case that I gave, I think, is an example of that, okay? Where you can think about the logics of that kind of mechanism, okay? Which might be empowering communities if it's designed in a way that actually is um, uh, sensitive to that, but it's a global supply chain that gets its incentives from trade legislation from the US and Europe. Why? Because traditionally protectionist companies also want to enforce, uh, now care about developing countries' enforcement because they benefit economically. It makes no sense, but it's actually happening, right? Top down, bottom, I have no idea, but it's actually an orchestrator you need to have to make sure that everything's logical with that kind of pathway, right? So the, to me, there are solutions around these problems, and I don't think it's a case of, therefore, simply experimentalists trying things out. That, that might lead to learning 10 years later that red, plus, that red didn't work, we needed red plus. In my opinion, we run experiments on so many policy instruments that never had any real chance of achieving their goals because they were type one, type two misdiagnosed, okay? So why not first get together like we are now, discuss what instruments might have some plausible logics through learning to achieve problems, and run the experiment on only those ones. Because those are the minority ones now that are actually having the experiment uh, run on. And just one final example that I didn't show you here, which I think is really important then, is that um, when we do this sort of type one, type two, type three problem-focused approach, that can better understand then and focus what we're talking about with our instruments. So my argument on forest certification is that its best days are still yet ahead if we narrow its scope to commercial logging practices. But if we give it biodiversity conservation, if we give it climate, right, I would say it's, it's going to fail under the weight of too many burdens, and it's going to take the problem definition off of government land use planning that ought to happen instead. Right? So better linking to the problems to me is the, is the real challenge here, integrating communities and national approaches together and giving up the top-down, bottom-up terminology, I would argue. Okay, so I'll stop there. Thank you again, Ben. Now, plenty of time for questions and answers from the Ben and from the two respondents. Uh, Daniela and Robert, would you turn around also so you can also get some other questions? Who would be the first? Yes, please. We have mics wandering around. I think that's good for the, uh, both recording and also for everyone being able to listen. And if you will please say your name and where you're from. Yes, in there. Uh, my name is Lance Robinson. I'm with the International Livestock Research Institute. Uh, ben, I'm, I'm not sure if if I understood the, uh, in the the classification uh, type one, two, and three that the that classification is something inherent in the problem because it seems to me it's 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 a nature it's a it's a characteristic of the solution and whether or not. It's a type one, type two, or type three. It seems to me to be um, a problem. It seems to me to be a subjective political value judgment that also depends on whether or not we've actually found a solution. Um, and I, I mean, use the uh, global climate change as an example, and I'll, I'll use a more local kind of example where um, national. Uh, National Forest Service personnel or National Parks personnel will often identify the level of poaching or level of forest degradation as as something unacceptable. As something, this is you know this is a top priority thing. We can't compromise on this. This is in in these terms a type three problem. Um, and whereas there may well be win-win solutions that they haven't thought of or or don't believe exist. Um, and so the, how, how do you, if you want to do this as a, as a proactive uh, approach to problem analysis and, and solution identification, how do you go through that process of deciding? Is it type one, type two, or type three? Ben, a question for you. Yeah, actually, I love this question. I was actually thinking about it as I was pondering this uh, today, because even if you go back to Eleanor Ostrom, she'll say that actually the very same problems can move categories depending on the institutions you impose on them. 
So there's two parts to this. One is what's the problem itself, what are the underlying conditions and features and so on. And then is it possible to be creative and develop an intervention that might lead to uh, type one? Because type one would be, of course, the, the best scenario if you could get it. I would argue that probably in most cases, it's, the most problems are not type one. All right. But you could actually distinguish this way. So you would need to look at both creative solutions and the problem itself together, it seems to me, just assess whether type one might be possible. So it's not an objective identification where you just say, here it is, it's type one. Right? In fact, for type three problems, it's, it's political. You decide whether or not you want to give it type three status. Um, you can rely on the science to inform your discussions. Right? Whether or not you want any more tropical biodiversity loss in order to have economic development is going to be a political decision. But you can be informed by the science of deforestation and biodiversity loss. My point is, we're not being honest about the fact that we're actually wanting a type 2 solution. Uh, we're actually pre pretending it's type 3. And it's actually all about type 2. All of our instruments are type 2. So I'm saying, we've got to allocate which type we're talking about and then we propose instruments, red, red plus, illegal logging, whatever else, tell me how it'll meet that type or not. And oftentimes when you do that, that logic falls away and it's not there. So I'm asking for greater transparency about what one is arguing is the, is the type that they're considering. Right? Environmental groups and the timber industry and other sectors may debate a lot about whether they want to probably be type two or type three, fantastic. But if you're honest about it, I think we can get to more creative solutions than if we're actually hiding and fooling ourselves about that. Do we want to come back on the question? Or? No. Then this. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Moritz von Unger, um, uh, Atlas Environmental Law Advisory. Ben, and, um, a, a question that links up to this. It's, I, I find this very, very exciting, um, including the remark that we should um, set our, um, we should make that decision and, and be clear about whether it's type one, type two, type three, before we make it. And if if there's if, I mean, I see whether this is a compromise or a win-win or or something with the red line involved, um, which would then be type three, I guess. Now my question is also, um, given your your example for the win-win, where you where you had that illegal logging sustainability chain. Um, um, example, uh, who exactly is the actor of that and who is the addressee uh, for this learning frame and who is, who is the actor to, to make the decision? Because um, in the end, even though there's a, this, well, you had that example with the top-down approach, bottom-up, yeah. you don't know. I mean, the, the, the European Commission, for instance, tries to, you know, to link the, the, the timber debate to the voluntary agreements that they have. So there's more, there's an engaged process, but in the end it's a unilateral decision, yeah. which at least could come if, if, if countries don't cooperate. Yeah. So there's a clear, there's someone, sometimes the actors are, are very different of, of um, and then probably also the decision whether it's a win-win or a compromise or something else. Yeah. Can I respond? So um, I would agree with Daniela and uh, that whenever you're looking at these kinds of multi-level governance um, architectures, um, policy decisions will be diffuse along a range of actors. Okay, so governments that fund, provide resources to the system, you supply chain tracking or voluntary partnership agreements, negotiations and so on. Uh, the companies that lobby for legislation and the wording of the legislation. Uh, the domestic governments who then negotiate what it means to be illegal or not, um, how you audit for compliance in the tracking process. There's, like, there's a whole bunch of choices that are made at various scales. And my point is that the only way to then have that orchestra is to have some kind of engagement about policy learning that binds that entire community towards the causal logics of what's going on. Because again, it's counterintuitive that you would actually keep standards modest, but I think actually um, when you work it out, it makes sense for the beginning. Um, and, and if I'm wrong, great, but then you have the whole collective discussion. Why would that hypothesis be incorrect? You'd actually puzzle through cause and effect scientific processes versus just focusing on what do I want. The problem now is we're all having great hybrid models out there. FSC with RED, um, legality and FLAG. I mean, the hybrids are endless. 
But if you go behind them and ask the question, well, what's their, uh, what are their propositions about cause and effect and the problems they care about? Fairly loosely formed, actually. So I'm saying there's a lot of value add to be had by simply getting more focused on what might be the possibilities. Okay? I'll give you an example, a real world example, of how this diffusion might actually affect individual choices. The FSC, about 15 years ago, went through a process where Swedish forest companies, who were one of the first to join the FSC, okay, to get global recognition for the standard, um, said to the environmental community, look, we've got a problem here. This is a new system, so the, the, we want to get our, our lumber to market. But in Sweden, we've got this really weird old system where our mills are not connected to where our, uh, we harvest our trees. So if we want to maintain chain of custody certification, we've got to expend a lot more um, global emissions, emissions from energy to move that wood over to our mills. Because right now, we simply swap with other companies who have their mills closer by. We save transportation costs. But it means that that wood isn't F formally FSC. So would you mind, they said, would you mind a system where we just said percentage in, percentage out? So the same percent of our wood that went in as FSC, we got out as a label. Okay? Now Greenpeace said no because that wouldn't be authentic, okay? That would, not be, that would be giving a label and a non-certified product as certified. So what happened was a new system emerged, now called the PFC, that right away said, yeah, no problem, okay? Ten years later, Greenpeace and its allies learned that that actually was a mistake, and they actually acquiesced and said, yeah, for initial uptake, getting market to, to supply, that slowed things down. And that's why they had another percentage labeling system. So my point is, if we could have sped up that learning process, you could have actually had more efficient mechanisms taking place. There's a gap in this kind of causal knowledge. Greenpeace was right on the actual problems they cared about, but the causal mechanisms didn't work the way they wanted. So, you know, so generating broader causal knowledge can affect a whole bunch of choices simultaneously that are diffuse. Good. Then it's Gera. Thank you, Niels. Uh, my name is Gary Steindlecker. I worked for 17 years for an international organization leading the global program, not Greenpeace, it was WWF. I'm now a consultant on Listen, Integrating Sustainability Solutions. Uh, thanks for the, first of all, congratulations to the hosts. I think this is the second most important event of all of these two days in the Landscape Forum. Uh, and you have made great presentations. Still, I'm really disappointed because we miss, I think we missed a little bit the issue. And I, I allow the floor for a quick test with the audience. Okay. Uh, it takes me maybe only 30 seconds and maybe I can then prove whether we missed uh, the uh, issue, yes or no. So now we go for a test, everyone. Yes. <laughs> That's great. Um, and my first, um, so I, Ben, your presentation, you asked, you said, uh, these are ideas, you provoke the debate, it's not necessarily true. From my perspective, I just say my perspective, I do entirely agree what you said. I have a question here, who does disagree uh, to, let's say, the majority, what Ben said? He, he asked us, I think that would be a good feedback for your presentation. So who, who do t t disagree with the three types and the learning, etc.? Number one. Nobody. Oh, oh one. <laughs> this, is Im this is an important person to talk to. One. Okay, but nobody else. Sec 50 50. Also an important person to talk to. Second question, and I um, have a look. I, um, yes. Um, who is coming from, s who is a forester here? May I ask you who is a forester? Forest background. Thank you. Science background. Thank you. NGO background. Thank you. Business background. Business and industry background. One, one and a half, two persons. So I pose now my, my two pitches here are Failure one is, um, we said, obviously we talked to the wrong people. We all agree, or the majority agrees, what you said, Ben. But still, I mean, there is no 
there is no need that we discuss. We discuss with the wrong people. Failure two is the word governance, and this is why we missed the issue of the, I think, uh, the theme of, of, the, of the dialogue here was governance and legal frameworks. Who is governing landscapes? Do we really think it's governed by governments alone? No. It's clearly governed by cash. And this is investment, and investment is 98% in the hand of the private sector. So my pitch here is, and I hope and I ask you whether you agree yes or no, um, we should from now on talk in a different way to other people and we should talk about how can we motivate these people that they talk with, her, with us, that they talk to us. This is the crucial issue because we are willing Six or seven years ago, I made a presentation here in front of 46 ministers, and I said the concept of sustainable forest management is dead. Not because it's not good, but it's a singular approach, and if you cannot attract those who are really impacting forests, you talk to each other, but you have no chance to, to be relevant at all. And this is, and my second pitch is, we really need to think when we talk about governance, it's a word which for a non-native speaker implies it's governments who do governance. We need to think about the real players and how we can involve them in this, in this discussion. Yes. Thank you, Carol, for stimulating the discussion. We are here for discussion forum. I will let Ben and the two respondents first respond, and then I'm so lucky that one of those who disagree a little with Ben is on my next, next list. So please, Ben. Or Daniela or Robert? Um, or you want some more input from the floor first? Yeah, I mean, uh, some disagreement? You, I mean, I mean, I mean I, of course, I really appreciate those comments. Um, uh, I think the, on the issue of the private sector, it's interesting because I talked to different communities, and I was actually involved in this big assessment of certification systems of mostly NGOs in the private sector, and they don't always talk to people here. So I think that actually that is one of the key challenges of creating this collective policy learning is that we are not in the same workshops and conferences, we're in different ones. And how to do that in ways that are comprehensible, coherent, right? but actually still getting those multiple voices is I think the fundamental question for architecture, building, and design. Um, Robert? I mean, I, and I think in, in my view, the, the role of industry is not something we can take for granted, but there is a point to be taken here that while we all have and are entitled to opinions on policies and governance and institutions, whether or not they have effect quite often depends on what governments decide. And so it's aligning this, uh, these, these structures to allow for the voice of, of all these players to have a role I I within the continuum of policy of, of policy making and within the, the architecture. Because eventually, if uh, you don't, I mean, if eventually for you to have an institution, you most likely need parliament to, to pass a law. And so you have to somewhat align them. Um, and there's also the, the, the other, it's actually a fairly primary risk here, that industry, um, just like with various sectors, while a key player has a certain vested interest, in doing things. Um, the vested interest is not necessarily for the majority, but they still play a key role. For example, to deal with the various challenges of poverty or even uh, economic inadequacies, uh, you know, we need finances from taxes, which often it's industry that, that pays. So we must facilitate them, but we must always have a space within the, 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 the policy system to create coherence that allow for checks and balances so that uh, they don't have runaway influence. And we've seen ridiculous scenarios previously where, for instance, regulators are found to be completely compromised by industry. And you remember the Gulf of Mexico problem where the regulator for the oil industry, it was found wasn't actually seem to have become quite complicit 
in allowing for some sort of self-reporting in an area that stood to cause significant economic and ecological risk. And examples are abound, for example, in the forestry and wildlife sector across, across the world. And so in order to avoid this, because the risk of that is that we could be very com 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 complacent and also complicit in the wrongs that, that happen. So the, the risk, the consequence could, could be very drastic. And so we must have checks and balances. So while we allow for a significant role and input of industry, I think the, the, the argument I would, uh, responding to our comment there is that governments don't necessarily manage these landscapes, but they provide a critical glue within the system that I don't think we should underestimate. Daniela? Okay, um, my colleagues already have responded to that, and I appreciated this, um, your intervention here and your experiment. And I already outed myself as an idealist. And um, what I would like to ask you is, are we really going to give the power to the money? Is this the way what you're approaching for, saying that, oh, well, because these are the ones ruling the world, so we have to discuss with them, and if they agree, then we come to a conclusion? So my idea or my standpoint was that we are sort of hinting towards something like, which is called the deliberative democracy, which is called that we need to enforce laws, which is, by the way, in the end done by governments and by rules. And these governmental rules are enforced in order to overcome just to be ruled by money. That was, that's the reason why we have these kind of rules still by government. But this needs to be feedbacked by the life world, which means like the societies, those dealing with the problems and the issues. So it needs to be controlled by that, and this needs to be bridged into some steering which should overcome the only uh, money perspective. Yes, you may. Here, you get... Uh, so, no, the answer is very clear. No, it should not be ruled by the money. The only thing is, when I had, had a look at the performance of sustainability, it's either... The, the discussions are either done by governments and stakeholders, or it's done within the business and industry sector. But there is hardly, even in an organization where I was participating in many years, there are two strands. The one is dealing with business, the other is with policy. There is no integration. And this is what I say. I have now four people on the list, and I have also two from industry. So I hope that you might come back to some industry. Andrew, you were one of the ones who disagreed, and I saw you also, Robert. Now I have five on the list. Yeah, I just, I just want to make sure that we don't end up in a, in a, in a classic dichotomization between the good and the bad. And we won't even mention the ugly. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you attended the session this morning uh, where there were three representatives who were all presenting the evidence of what the private sector is trying to do. And the overwhelming feedback I got from many people who were during that session was, I think a lot of people were surprised of how far the private sector has come in terms of driving shifts in sustainability. And I don't think we should forget that. So that's, that's just a first point in terms of that discourse, which could quickly risk falling into this binary uh, view of the world. So that was the, but my, my question really for Ben was, I, it's not a disagreement, Ben, it's more because we are in a seminar uh, and you are the professor, but we can still, we're, we can still challenge you as a professor. And my, my question for you, Ben, is, is I got the impression you assume in the presentation that we are good at learning either as a species or as institutions. And I question that assumption. And I question that assumption because I think I've got to the stage in my career where I've identified something I call the 30-year rule. And that is many institutions go back to doing exactly what they did 30 years ago when they've got through this 30 years. And as an example, the World Bank has just gone through a significant restructuring where they have created an agriculture department and a natural resources department as completely separate units. And this is exactly what existed in the late 1980s. It meets the same 30-year rule. And there are many other examples. So I just wanted... Ben, to, to ask you and challenge you, I mean, how good do you think we are as a species at actually learning 
uh, or our institutions at actually learning to achieve change rather than simply just going back every 30 years to where we were. I'll take one more question before I come back to the panel because we had you also and you also disagreed a little, you said, half-half. So I'm uh, Ingrid Visseren, I'm from Wageningen University and I'm a member of the IUFRO uh, Task Force on Governance. So I've actually thought, uh, thought a bit uh, about uh, learning architectures together with uh, Ben and others. So uh, I, I, I have to partially ag agree because uh, you know, I'm part of the, the learning architecture uh, um, uh, thinking. Uh, but while I was thinking about it uh, over the past couple of months and, uh, uh, or so, or, or longer, but uh, as part of the task force for the last couple of months, um, uh, the question that came back to my mind the whole time, and I think that's actually what we're discussing now, the essence of the discussion, and which I really appreciate, by the way, the discussion that we're in the middle of, is how far can we get with learning and where does, you know, how far will learning take us? And where does power, politics, and interest come in? So what if, and I, I would like to raise this question to all three uh, speakers today, because I think they, they might all have a, a, a different uh, contribution to part, part of the answer to this. Um, you know, what to Ben, so what if people don't agree on the type of problem that we're in the middle of, or what if people don't want to agree on the type of problem uh, that we're in the middle of, um, or what if people or institutions or, uh, or organizations don't want to be honest about the type of problem that they uh, think that they're in the middle of. Um, and what if actors don't want to join a learning architecture that could come up with creative solutions? So basically, my, my, my bottom, bottom line question is how far can we get with learning, which I, I really think we can get a far way, uh, you know, we can really make a difference, but I think at some point the learning stops and the power comes in. Perhaps an example from, uh, from uh, my uh, earlier work at Greenpeace, um, I used to have a, an agreement, if you will, uh, with WWF that I would tease the companies into their arms. So there is a role for, for the stick and there is a role for the carrot, if you will. And maybe, um, um, well, and that worked great, you know, because there is a role for the green pieces of this world and there is a role for the WWFs of this world. From coming from an NGO perspective, so where uh, you could learn, you could look at the WWF as part of the learning architecture, and 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 Greenpeace as part of the more political uh, part of the discussion. So where is the balance between power and learning? I guess is my question. So Ben, Robert, and Daniela, where is the balance? Which arm I teased into now? Who wants to start? Um, okay, so um, I actually agree with Andrew and Ingrid and thought I was actually saying that. So let me um, just come back a little bit. Um, on the 30-year rule, I mean, we're now having Landscape Day when 30 years ago we had land use planning. So we're even right now doing the same thing, right? And with that we had 30 years of an evolution from land use planning to multiple use to ecosystem management, which gave actually biodiversity type three. And then that wasn't like, so we had SFM, and now we're back to landscape. So yes, I completely agree. And, and my point actually is, how do we break out of these cycles and actually get stickiness and effectiveness over problems? How we do that? So um, I'm glad to clarify that I actually completely agree. Right? Um, on the issue of whether our species can learn, I think my point by saying architecture was that we are not very good at it. Just the way Ostrom said, we're not even good at the timber depletion stuff, which is a real easy challenge compared to the rest, right? And so her solution was develop a, an institution. So I think an institution on learning that can fa facilitate this diffusion of policy choices might get us somewhere, okay? Now, on Ingrid's point about how far it can go, I thought that was my point. So type one, which are actually the, I would argue, you know, that, they're great when they happen, but they're pretty rare. But type one requires a lot of careful puzzling through and thinking. Um, that does relate to how NGOs uh, learn in some way. For example, um, there's a lot of, I would argue, unlearning happening. I would argue, for example, on boycott campaigns, which is a, a traditional Greenpeace strategy, and then you hand over them to WWF, right? 
I would argue that these strategies are a lot less effective than we think they are. And the reason that is, we want to have a victory. And so when the company agrees to your demands, you feel really great. And you go, they go from being a villain to being now, you give them ads in your times and you love them. And so the result is, I would argue, that we don't keep the pressure on. I mean, it's a very short-lived pressure. And unless that pressure is institutionalized into a certification system or ongoing, ongoing economic incentive, like, for example, the Lacey Act or the EUTRs, which are sticky, they're not going to change back, um, we might over-exaggerate the impacts. And by doing so, we actually undermine our own problem-focused efforts. So I think we can all learn in different ways about how strategies um, uh, occur and how to better improve them. But I would argue that power is the reason why we're having these problems on land grabs and carbon cowboys. That's, that we're not actually, um, we're pretending that we're involved in a uh, type one uh, problem when in fact it's not. So I'm saying, why don't we first say, whether we're an industry or NGO, what do we conceive this problem as? Is it a type two for us? And then what's the solution we're offering? Or we're saying, no, it's a type three. Here's the solution. And that would at least get us to be honest about what we're trying to do, which might therefore uncover some innovative solutions and also be honest about that. No, this is a power, simple power uh, kind of an impact. And we are companies that um, are making a lot of money by deforesting. And we have the power. And we want to keep on doing it, right? Uh, if we don't ask that question, we could be accidentally just fostering power in the name of thinking we're actually deliberating and doing things meaningfully, right? Daniela or Robert? Robert? Well, I think one of the, one of the reasons why we have these cyclic uh, notions of, of changes, like you've pointed out a 30-year cycle, is quite often because I think the learning process is uh, underpinned by the interests we bring to the table, whether it's as individuals, as governments, as industry. And interests have a way of linking with power and informing the end, in a sense then that you're not so worried about the, the process or the quality of the outcome, but how fast and beneficial the outcome is. And I remember <clears throat> about 19 years ago when I was, uh, about two decades ago when I was preparing to do my final primary school exam, there's a lesson they gave us because it was a multiple choice uh, mathematics exam. And they said, well, when they set the question, they are going to give you choice A, B, C, D. Now, what they are going to do is that A will be the fastest answer. And D is likely to, C or D are likely to be the best but last stage of the inquiry. And so if you are worried about the fastest answer and you do the first stage of the mathematical problem, you will quickly see that you got the answer that is listed as A and you will shed that you've got the answer. And the consequence of that is that when they evaluate their test, you'll have done poorly or probably fail the, the test. And this is the thing with, um, with various interests. Even look at the COP negotiations. It's the thing about the interest that people bring to the table. Quite often, as he says, if it's Greenpeace, you're looking for the fastest uh, solution that brings a victory and sort of plays to your sense of power. But in actual sense, we need to have a sense of sustenance that keeps us on the problem until we get the best and most high quality outcome. The challenge is though that the process of getting the best and most high quality outcome is quite often not funny. And you, it could be expensive. It's not necessarily the least cost. And it could be a painful one. And think about, for example, if you're trying to negotiate compromises. As we've seen governments having trouble with communities with respect to extractive industry, negotiations of contracts or land acquisitions. And you find, because they are worried about the consequences in the forthcoming general elections, governments will go for the fastest solution that is not necessarily the most sustainable. The likelihood is that five years later, just before the next election, the steam of this solution that was agreed upon will have dried out and will be back to the same... So then we, we, in a sense, then the system of learning is not sustained. And so we actually, I don't think we can say we learn anything. We sort of manipulate the process and eventually we are back to the drawing table. Okay, um, I think my colleagues have already more or less mentioned everything. I just wanted to come back to what Ingrid says about um, power, does learning stop when power comes in? I think there is always power in. There is no way 
out of power. I think power is all around us and um, there is so many different forms and we all know about it. And uh, for me, one powerful situation is as well communication. And the question is, how then, how can we communicate in a way and how can we deliberate with each other in a way that we can sort of minimize the power effects in a way that we come, can as well adapt to rational solutions? And I think this is a real the real challenge then, and this doesn't matter. This does mean doesn't mean that um, different institutions are out. You you pointed to uh, Greenpeace situations, and I, I totally agree with you. There is a role for the Greenpeaces in the world. There is a group for, role for for WFs, and there's a role for the industries in the world. But for the communication, is needed that we try to well react to each other, that we try to trust in each other, and so forth. So there is power, but it is it is needed, and we need to try to. Use it in a way that it is effective. Great. I have five more on my list of, of questions. And then we also want our rapporteur, Caroline Haywood, who is really working hard from IDLO, to try to give you an overview of what we are summing up and reporting back. So we um, have a good session here. First, you, please. Yes. OK. Good evening. Um, I'm Abila Pride, a student of the University of Hohenheim in Germany. I'm doing my master's in agricultural science and in the tropic and subtropic. During the last session, um, I was really, really happy to see lots of government officials from uh, the south, that is South America, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, Asia. I was really hoping to meet most of them here when coming here because my question would have been directed to them. But since we have um, lots of people with lots of experience, when the keynote speaker was talking, he mentioned simple things that they still puzzle me why it's going on. We all know that um, the main problem right now with um, uh, landscape is economic development. That is, multinationals going into Africa, either for biogas, either for minerals, and other things. My question is this simple. Why is it that difficult for these African leaders or the leaders from the South to try to protect their environment or the landscape just as simple with policies just like the counterparts from the North? Why is it that difficult for them to implement simple policies that can protect the landscape just like the counterparts from the North? Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll take one more question, please. Yes, thank you. And that's actually quite connected to that. My name is Ina Neuberg. I work for the World Future Council. And... Uh, it's five o'clock on the Sunday, and um, I uh, now dare to ask the question, you know, what am I going to take back into my work from this landscape forum? And um, so, Robert, my question sort of really goes out to you, because we work with parliamentarians of national parliaments, and uh, concretely, we work on forest policy in East Africa, and uh, we have the situation there, you probably agree that we have policies in place which are not so bad, which have participatory approaches, but they're not implemented. They're not happening on the ground. So, and we talked to parliamentarians, and I've learned this weekend that, uh, well, landscapes are a social construct, and they're as big as they have to be. So I think parliamentarians think in landscapes because they have a landscape, which is their constituency. And so when I now go back to my work... Can you tell me what I should campaign for? You know, can you give me some concrete examples, what I should tell them? What are the next steps? How can you integrate the landscape approach into your work as a national legislator with a constituency in East Africa? You get some easy questions this afternoon. <laughs> Who will start? <laughs> Robert, it was directed to you, the last one. Oh, well, thank you very much. Well, I will uh, attempt to respond to both, and I hope I'll have much luck with that. And the first question was uh, with respect as to why it is difficult for leadership in the South to, uh, to implement measures that, to, for instance, protect the interest of people and, and, and the ecology. I'd, I'd give you the easiest one that come to my mouth that doesn't say anything, and I'd say transformative leadership. I don't even understand what that means myself. So I'll, I'll, I'll give um, 
no, it's because I was reading about it this morning. Um, <laughs> there, is, there, is a, there is a key point about um, objectives and priorities. You see, Africa, for example, is replaying, well, not so much a 30-year cycle, Andrew is saying, maybe a, a century long, but we are sort of seeing the scramble for Africa back again from you know the meeting in 1888 that was convened by Otto von Bismarck and others uh, to partition Africa for colonialism. And we are seeing the mapping of the continent with respect to technology allowing for finding of resources, uh, extractive industry, land, and so on and so forth. And this means, therefore, that by an accident of fate or by a consolidation of global interest in Africa, Land and natural resources have, sat, have then become the second most important resource on the African continent after its people. And we've got to make that distinction, the people being the first most important resource. So since this is happening, and I'm not sure anything we say today will change that this is happening, we then have to find a certain way to translate this global interest into our interest. Some sort of symbiotic relationship must emerge. And this goes back to what mechanisms do countries have to consolidate what their national interests are. And, and, and this, is, this is very, very complicated in many senses because um, there are very many shades of gray that, that happen. There are many shortcuts that have emerged in, in, in getting some of these mechanisms in place for investments. There are the traditional checks and balances that, for example, a treaty needed to go before parliament for approval doesn't happen because there is an administrative way of approving a bilateral investment treaty. So that just means that parliament will never engage with that treaty agreement that will extend protection to three or five multinationals aligned to the country that is negotiating the treaty. So this, this, this is part of the problem. So then we must, the, the challenge here is that there seems to be a deficit at the moment in converting this global interest to serve our purpose as Africans. And these conversations are beginning to happen. There's an extremely vibrant conversation going on in Nairobi at the moment with respect to extractive industries on two levels. The first level is with respect to community access and benefit sharing, the local host communities, but that is somewhat secondary to the higher level with respect of, to assuring that, in fact, the economic benefits that we want to share are secured and are actually available to do that just as much as protection of the environment. And this is then some of the ways we convert these global interests into being our own interests. And this is, this is something that a lot of people are passionate about and you can tell from how I'm speaking about it, that we then need to get our legislatures and our legislatures and other policymakers to see this. And the mining, draft mining law in Kenya is stuck. And it's stuck because civil society groups scholars and other people have placed roadblocks in its way. And because they have placed roadblocks, industry is also placing roadblocks because everybody is trying to get the best preferred outcome from it. But what this is actually doing, it's delaying it, but it's provoking a conversation that we need. Because once we do that, then we have a balanced conversation. Talking about communities accessing benefits is somewhat it's somewhat academic if we don't secure the actual revenues in a way and we don't actually secure the protection of the environment. So that goes to the first question. On the second question, uh, with respect to this question... Robert, of politics, watch out for time also. I have three more on the list. So, yeah. so I'll, I'll be first on Great. this one. Um, is, is that legislatures, at least in my experience, think in bullet forms. Members of parliament, they're representative of, of people. They have an election in four or five years. They tend to think in bullet format. They want to know, how am I going to translate this into an action at my constituencies? And then my, my point then is very basic. Let's begin, as part of social learning and as part of building this architecture, let's begin to have a disaggregation of outputs and outcomes as we put in place mechanisms, because this is important, because if they don't understand what it is you are asking them to approve, 
they'll either change it because they don't understand or they won't approve it. And, and I think we can look anywhere in the world and you will see that is a likely outcome with respect to where you need members of parliament to approve anything. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, the audience. And then I think we should let Caroline, just to involve you in how we report back, Caroline will present how we report and you have time to comment on that also. It was you first. Great, thanks. Um, Kate Horner from the Environmental Investigation Agency. I was um, really pleased to see um, some of the, the coalitions to address illegal logging on your slide. We have the pleasure of convening the coalition in the United States that you mentioned. So I thought I would just reflect a little bit upon how that came to be and, and maybe some of the additional lessons that could be learned from it. Um, I think it's important to note, firstly, that the the problem that we were trying to address on the ground was a unique recognition of the role of international market demand in, and weak governance in resulting in this environmental crisis. Um, there, the idea was, of course, that as long as there is an international market for illegal goods, it's very difficult to increase enforcement on the ground. So there had to be some sort of international cooperation to address it. Um, the it was a, an idea that you had to make the rules matter before you can talk about then making the rules what they need to be. It's, it's, it's obviously sequential. Um, it's, I, I note that because the, the coalition that was convened in the United States of industry and environmental and labor organizations is win-win, but it's not the whole picture. It's a convenient construct, but there are losers in that battle. Um, and I think it's important to be mindful of that, I think, political economy that has been raised a couple of times from the floor. Um, and so I just, I, I also wanted to talk about it because I think it's, it's really important to the problem that we face here in the landscapes discussion. Um, and while we've had, I think, an, an interesting academic discussion about uh, governance and legal frameworks, we haven't actually talked about what the governance and legal frameworks could be or what, in fact, the, the problem is that we're trying to address in the landscape sector. And I would argue, I think we as an organization that looks at illegality has been looking at this in landscapes and found that there is a serious problem of, I think, I would, I would highlight two that, that merit attention. One, in terms of how land use decisions are made, especially for large-scale agriculture, there is increasing recognition that in palm oil across the world, um, a significant amount of it is illegal. Um, in the Congo, they have plans to develop palm oil that would treble log production in the country. Much of that is illegally allocated. The other piece of it is, I think, foreign inflows of capital into the country. We have a really interesting and I think unique tool in the voluntary guidelines, which I, I've talked about before in, in other panels, and I don't mean to harp on it, but I think it's a useful tool that builds on this the, the top-down to bottom-up bottom up approach, that we have some principles about how to govern this, I think, unique international challenge that we face in terms of international finance and how that can be then entrenched in, nas in national law. So I wanted to put those two forward, particularly because they highlight the, the role of, of governance to these problems that we're trying to address. Thank you. And that is Jose Campos. Thank you, Niels. Jose Campos. And following up on the learning issue, and we are talking here about smart interventions. He mentioned policies and institutions, but we, we should also add technologies. And I think uh, we, we need to see this learning as a process of evolution and evolving to something that adapts and would be more effective to the new needs. Coming back to the uh, governance issue, uh, there are scales, global and national governance, and I think the discussion has focused more on those scales. But how about the governance of the landscape, per se? Uh, and I think we need to, to have a look at the formal or informal uh, structures for governing landscapes and how they could create a bet better enabling environment or actually uh, foster collective action, because what we need is action now fast, as fast as possible. Thank you, Mr. Campos. Do you want to have two more, or do you want to respond now? Um, well, it's, it's the, either way, it's fine. I mean, um, okay. 
Mike's from our side, sorry. All right, Dara Conway from Climate Focus. Um, thanks, thanks a lot for these presentations. They've been really useful in the discussion as well. Um, I think we've discussed a lot about governance and a lot about political process today, but there's been less direct talk about, about legal frameworks. Um, Robert, you touched on it a bit, but it's been a bit a bit peripheral, and I think it's, it's useful to have a little bit more of that talk. When you talk about prioritization in your type three, and we talk about how it's, it's very difficult to entrench all these political processes, you know, the five-year election cycle happens, priorities change, there's always power interests, and legal frameworks are a really important way of doing that. You know, you've got different, different levels of law, you know, from the constitution to the statute to the regulations that have a really important role in, in entrenching those priorities. So a good example in the, in the Red Plus and in, in this context, you mentioned indigenous rights earlier on. Um, entrenching indigenous rights in constitutions, like it's been happening in Latin America, and coupling that with good enforcement systems but has been a very, very effective way. I know IDLO is involved in a lot of this, you know, developing these frameworks, which is really, really important. Um, so I, I just wanted to raise it, and I know we're toward the end, we're not going to have time to discuss much more, but uh, in case you, uh, particularly Robert, if anyone has some th more thoughts on that. Thank you for that excellent point. Yeah, Dr. Mary Claire Cordonia Seger, and I'm senior legal expert at the IDLO. I think just three points in response to a fascinating panel. Thank you. The first one is um, there is an argument that sustainable development laws are about process. They're about making sure decisions are made in the right way, due diligence, taking into account all the stakeholders' views. I disagree. I think there's a substantive and very clear requirement if one wants to call something sustainable development. So I'm going to push back a little bit on the idea that you can put anything into a sustainable development box and have it look still sustainable. And law is actually quite comfortable dealing with this issue. A famous judge once said, I'm not going to describe to you what pornography is, but you put it in front of me, I'll know what it is, right? <laughs> okay? And I think sustainable development on the substance, if we look at the exact resource, you know, whether it's forest and a mined out landscape, or whether it's water and a completely dried and depleted stream, we can say whether it's being used sustainably or not. So this is what is quite exciting about the landscape approach and, and about the multi-level governance issue that we're talking about here, because the, the issue is, in a way, how to bring in the different sectors of the landscape itself. And this is where I get to my last point, which is just that, of course, laws and institutions are actually written by people. And so it's not surprising that they're about people and people's interests and powerful people have their interests heard a little bit better than the ones that don't have that power. But, and this is where I think C4 and our colleagues here at the science uh, forums have been very, very helpful to us. We have tools to get some of those thresholds that aren't just invented by people, but are realities on the ground for sustainability to the decision makers. And I think maybe in this panel, we can look a little bit further forward on our multi-level governance in terms of some of the innovative ways that law can help us to ensure that science is taken into account, not just in the process, but on the substance in helping to shape decision making. So I think that's kind of the last point that I would want us to end on here. I don't disagree with anything that was said, with the exception that sustainable development is completely mutable. But I do think that it can be grounded. And the science reaching the decision makers, when it has been truly independent, even when it tells us things we don't want to hear, is actually an incredibly important lesson for lawmakers and judges to learn. That was nice to hear, Marie Claire. Thank you. Now back to the panel. Four different persons' questions. Would you like to respond? Ben, starting you. Um, OK, sure. These are actually. Uh, all four great points, and you know we think about these questions very thoughtfully and carefully, so I can't in a few minutes give them the justice they deserve. So I just give a couple of quick points. On the illegal logging issue in the coalitions in the United States, it's actually one of the topics we're really doing a lot of work on, and I completely appreciate the points that were made. So what I'm going to do instead is just give you an idea as to how policy learning might actually help that kind of coalition building. An example is, the first task force meeting that this uh, task force um, that Niels mentioned, the first meeting we held was in Singapore. And we brought in five members of local communities from Indonesia. And we said, here's our work that we're doing. 
on illegal logging and so on, does it make any sense to you? And what they said to us, one response was, a woman said to us, well, you know, we don't yet know what the effects will be of this instrument because it hasn't really been implemented yet, but we're worried because the local police force wants to be the enforcers of the law. And they're actually, they, she argued they were corrupt and that they would just get side payments and not do anything. So she said, we would prefer that when you design the instrument, when it's designed, that you have international third-party auditors um, be the assessors for compliance and verification. Okay? So this is curious. So now it's actually infringing sovereignty on the enforcement side, but actually encouraging sovereignty over the substance side. I was like, I had never thought about it this way. Turns out that Indone Indonesia has now agreed uh, a couple of years ago to allowing third-party international observers to be part of this process, which they were not in favor of 10 years ago. Okay? This affects power dramatically okay, between different groups. Okay? We were so excited, we wrote an article on this in a political science journal about this distinction that we got from a local um, um, uh, community forestry person. Okay? In other words, the learning occurred both ways. And it created a collective knowledge among a community that actually was reinforced and talked about how very small choices might be really empowering to different groups that we should think about in these processes. But overall, I really appreciate the point. Um, on the technology side, absolutely, technology is actually an equally important thing to think about for governance. Technology and supply chain tracking will determine whether we get effective governance or not. And these communities are rarely talk to each other. I mean, we had a uh, panel a few years ago on GIS technology and satellites for tracking with political scientists. And the, the learning was fantastic. And I completely agree that's really important. I haven't got time for more discussions. I'll leave the third one uh, to you, but I did want to raise the environment, power struggles, SD points, all really good. I would say that my key problem is that state development is so broad that there are powerful interests that want to keep it broad because they don't really mean it. Okay, so when we break them down into their component parts, we see disagreement where we thought we saw agreement. And this is the confusing type 2 and type 1 stuff. So I would be careful about being so abstract that we're not actually getting teeth. On the rule of law side, I would say that's often a place where you might get type 3 outcomes. For example, the United States has an interspecies legislation and accompanying legislation and other, and other pieces that says that federal land managers must maintain the viability of listed species, okay, regardless of economic impacts. This is a type three approach in the law. In 1973, it was created. But never passed now, created back then. It's sticky legislation, and it's the reason why the United States locked up most of its national forests in the Northwest to preserve the northern spotted owl, okay? So there is really important things you can think about, right? But I would add one more point, that we shouldn't just think the power dimensions are industry versus environment and communities. In fact, when it comes to this issue, communities were not in favor of biodiversity conservation at all. And this goes back to the constitutional point. A lot of constitutional scholars who argue for national constitutional rights are arguing for things that might go against community forestry concerns and incentives. So we should be honest that there's a bunch of different power dynamics that are happening, not just one or two. Thank you. Well, and, and quite often the, the challenge sometimes is balancing the interest of human rights versus the reality of what uh, conservation requires. And the two may at times be very, may fail to be you know, coherent with each other. And this, this, this is when you see communities taking governments to courts because uh, they are being blocked from doing certain things. I think sometimes we might idealize or romanticize the, the form and, and interest of communities. And I, mean, I think it's a conversation that has to go on. Um, two main things that I, I would like to respond to. One was a, a, a good comment made about the role of voluntary guidelines. Now, I, I think the voluntary guidelines play a major, major role in especially getting industry to be compliant to, you know, while retaining the stick of enforcement. But that just means that you require a functional rule of law system to do that. And if the rule of law is not working in a system as is happening in a lot of countries, then this just won't work because the stick that should follow doesn't actually come out clearly. And so then that, that creates a fundamental deficit of, uh, of compliance. Um, 
No, I think that uh, in terms of legal frameworks, um, there's a lot uh, to be said, and this is a conversation that people are still researching PhD dissertations on. Um, the, what's happening in terms of typology of laws, what's happening at the moment is that you, you're finding more and more second and third generation constitutional enactments that are in favor of fairly generous and complex entitlements, right to a clean and healthy environment, socioeconomic rights to food, water, housing, and other things. Um, but what that normally assumes is A, existence of a functional system where rule of law actually works, and by consequence B, a clear form of uh, actual imp downstream implementation. And then you face three main challenges. One is the element of illegality of actions, irregularity of actions, which is distinct from illegality in the sense that irregularity will often mean bypassing certain critical stages, such as where people are required to have public consultations, but actually don't have them effectively. And then you have illegitimacy, where laws are actually passed through all the formal processes, but actually don't serve the interest of the Constitution, envisaged that these laws would actually, would actually serve. In the long run, then, you have constitutional enactments that are pretty beautiful, but quite useless in the sense that they're not going to serve any, any purpose. And this is then why the original distinct discussion we had about the, the key elements you need to have to build functioning architecture is necessary because what you need to do is to eliminate this, the, to, to, to close the space for illegality, irregularity, and illegitimacy. And I remember a discussion from many years ago, I think I must have still been in undergrad law school, when a gentleman from Cameroon was giving an example of how uh, he was in a village where a lumber, an international logging company arrived with all the licenses to begin logging. And they came and found that the land they were coming to take was fully occupied by a community, yet they had the licenses from Yaoundé. So it is, that means that it is legal, but it is both irregular and illegitimate. Now, what kind of recourse do these people get? It is fully legal. What, and this is really the, the challenge. And this is some of the things that, uh, and so, uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at an academic conference, the last point uh, in, in Ottawa last year on environmental justice, uh, there was a discuss on, discussion on this constitutionalization of rights. And we, uh, I saw a lot of uh, scholars from developed countries arguing that they'd like their governments to enact constitutional rights to this and that. And my view was that, you know, I think you're probably pushing the most ineffectual route to achieve something here, because in a lot of cases, why we are having constitutionalization of rights is because of a collapse in the administration system of government, where, for instance, local authorities that had a primary job of availing clean water, clean and potable water for people to use, didn't do their job. So instead of fixing that, we put it in the constitution. Eventually, you realize we have to go and fix those local authorities, because they are the ones who will have the job of delivering on the water. What, what having it in the Constitution does is that it provides the most sacred protection and recourse to action. But still, we have to go back and fix the local authorities. So I think that's the response that I'd have to you. And this, if you can trace this across all the various sectors with, with that respect. Thank you. Thank you. Then I think we owe you also to show you and share with you how we report back from this session. That has not been an easy task, and you can see Caroline Haywood from ITLO has been working very, very hard. We got two questions, and we want to involve you in how Caroline is going to respond back so we can have your comments also before the close the session. So, now concentrate. This is what you heard for the last two and a half hour. Caroline. So, um, our conversation of the last two and a half hours uh, has to be summarized against these two questions, and I have 50 words per question. Uh, 
So I fear that anything that I provide it will be inadequate and um, apologise in advance for simplicity. Um, however, I think um, that there are um, perhaps two themes that came out very strongly uh, that we can use to address these questions. Uh, regarding the first question on how can landscape approaches contribute to the UNFCCC process, uh, I think one of the major themes that came out is that we need to be honest about the type of problem that climate change is and we need to have a debate around this. Uh, if it is a problem of paramount importance, the type three, or is it a type of problem, a type two type of problem where we need to find compromises? So I think that that's one thing that our discussion can bring to the UNFCCC process. The second um, is that landscape approaches might be able to contribute by placing this discussion uh, in institutions that convene global networks of stakeholders uh, from across the board. We had a lot of conversations about who those stakeholders are, who are more important, um, but basically, I think we reached a consensus that everyone needs to be there at the table, moulding the solutions together through this policy learning architecture. On the second point, um, or the second question, sorry, how can landscape approaches contribute to the design of sustainable development goals and their achievements? Well, I think here um, it's important to acknowledge that the SDGs attempt to address many problems. Um, and perhaps it's important to uh, ask what these, uh, what types uh, are these different problems? Let's discuss this. And um, understanding that any interventions that we undertake uh, to solve these problems um, are again founded in uh, a global network of stakeholders um, that allow a broad conversation across all um, sectors, as Daniela was talking about, and all levels, as, as Robert was more talking about with the, the vertical integration. And let's negotiate compromises. Um, then again, we need to ensure a coherence uh, to the design of the SDGs, and I think that our conversation about these sticky and durable institutions is quite useful here. Um, that these sticky institutions can establish this policy learning architecture and perhaps allow this coherence and integration. So neither of those answers were 50 words. I have an hour to uh, condense them into that. Uh, but uh, I hope that that vaguely summarizes our discussion and I um, welcome anyone who would like to come up afterwards uh, to provide some further uh, clarifications if you'd like to. And then there was a meeting reaction here. Caroline, that was a masterly or mistressly, however the feminine version of masterly uh, summary is. Um, Niels, would it be possible for us to consider adding just that we would consider within those things that you just summarised the role of science and um, drawing on historical um, knowledge to inform um, these, uh, these developments. Would that be acceptable to add? It, it seemed to me it came out of the discussion. That's good. Uh, this is the three organizers would combine that. So we want input from all of you. So, so whatever you want of input, please, this is the time. And also for the keynote speaker and the two responses. So can, ben? can I just say one quick yeah, point please. on that? Because I think um, on the, on the uh, um, first type of learning about problems, we do need science as a best it can tell us what to do and what the problems are, rather. Um, but on the uh, learning on instrument choice, I would argue Part of the problem is um, that the effects of the instruments we're choosing now have not yet happened. So relying only on past behavior for different instruments may not necessarily get us to think carefully and theoretically about interesting innovations and experiments that we haven't yet run. And I'm scared that the, the focus only on the past in that regard might actually lock off, lock off a lot of creative pathways for future impacts. Sorry, could I clarify? Maybe the mic wasn't on. I didn't use the word only. I, I said, could we add into the mix that we would draw on science and on historical uh, knowledge in addition to the things that Caroline said? Sorry, Ben. Oh, historical knowledge? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no sense of using only science. Absolutely okay. not. No. Okay, excellent. Yeah, oh, sorry, misunderstood. Good. Marie-Claire? Some exercise this afternoon. Yes, sorry. 
Um, again, I really want to congratulate Caroline. Um, that, that was excellent. And I think maybe science and the law, getting that, um, that interaction so that law is informed by science to get us to those type threes might be kind of the point that, um, that just rounds it out. Um, and this is everything from the Constitution to fixing those regulations and how we ensure that the corruption doesn't prevent them from working. So I, th I think that point is, is, is very, very clear when you say the vertical integration, and it's just a question of drawing it out so that it's um, also clear to a reader that, that we went through the, the whole levels. Thanks. Yeah. Would you be okay Maria Claire from ITLO. Andrew from C4 and Alexander Book from UFRO will sit together with the rapporteur and the three speakers and summarize that in the next hour. And if they don't manage to do that, they won't get any dinner. So <laughs> do you have more input for them so we can get a little more work for them? Or any other questions or comments? Yes. Yes, please, Robert. No, I just wanted to uh, sort of reinforce what Marie Claire was saying about science and the law. And it re it's just because it reminded me of uh, the earlier point on sustainable development. And you're actually finding that because of there is a disjoint existing between translation of science outcomes in, into law, um, you're finding increasingly a lot of legal enactments talking about sustainable development as, imper as an imperative. But it, you know, frontline workers have absolutely no idea what they're supposed to do to make this sustainable development actually happen. And it's a challenge of, for instance, translating the whole question of integration into, into laws and into regulations and to make sure members of parliament understand what it is you're talking about. Then maybe it will begin to work. But lawyers, the skill of lawyers stops at some point and scientists must contribute. Thank you. Yes, Dan. I think, I think this is an absolute crucial point which should be covered appropriately in, 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 in the reporting back that the landscape approach, if it can stimulate that it integrates policies, it integrates legal frameworks uh, of existing good ones, but they take into account on each other, if that could be stimulated by the landscape approach, it could be real a great act. Uh, I, I would agree if it was integration, integration. so it wasn't just law, but for, for market mechanisms, for example, how they interact to provide synergies, for example, right? Yeah. Versus a blunt kind of one... Yeah. 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 Anyone from the panel who wants to say more in the end? Then I think we have come to a closure because this has been two and a half hours of very stimulating discussions. And I think I maybe said something, not quoting correct uh, from the science article I mentioned, which came two days ago. The f loss of the forest in the tropics has in the last 12 years, on the average, been increasing by 2,100 square kilometers per year. So this means that what we're working with here is really important. So I would say again, thank you very much for coming. Thank you for our speakers, thank you to our rapporteur, and thank you to all of you for creating this stimulating discussion with lots of feedback. Thank you very much. Thank you.